When people talk about handheld game consoles, they typically picture something like this, not something like this. However, just because a game console didn't sell well, that doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, there are many great obscure portable game consoles. In fact, many consoles that failed miserably when they were alive were actually pretty awesome. So today on Stuff We Play, we're looking at the rare, the obscure, and the awesome as we count down my personal top five favorite obscure portable game consoles. So at number five, we have the Wonder Swan. Yes, even with a strange name like that, this is surprisingly awesome. This was created by Gunpei Yokoi, the same guy who created the Game Boy. After the failure that was Nintendo's Virtual Boy, which he also designed, he felt personally responsible for its failure and left Nintendo. However, he started designing this console with Bandai. Now, unfortunately, Gunpei Yokoi never lived to see the release of the Wonder Swan. The Wonder Swan has some interesting quirks. First off, you can play either like this, or you can play it on its side, like this. Furthermore, it has an insanely long battery life, but runs off of only one AA battery. However, much like the Game Boy, the screen had no lighting whatsoever, so unless you're playing in front of a light source, good luck seeing the screen. Now, they later released a Wonder Swan color shortly after the Game Boy color, and while it was a nice improvement, there was still no lighting. The most sought after version of the Wonder Swan is called the Swan Crystal. Still no back or front light, even though it came out in 2002 after the Game Boy Advance was already out. Well, actually that one had a horrible screen too. But still, you know, gotta innovate. Now while the Wonder Swan was never a major success in its native Japan, it did at one point capture nearly 10% of the handheld gaming market, which when you're going up against Nintendo of all people in the late 90s, is pretty respectable. Now as for games, first off I'd have to recommend Gunpei. Gunpei is a Wild West themed puzzle game, which is honestly really addictive. As you can imagine by the name, it's named after Gunpei Yokoi, and it's very easy to find. Consider it the Tetris of the Wonder Swan, if you will. Also, it knows that after the Wonder Swan color came out, Bandai struck a deal with Square, and Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 4 were remade and ported to the Wonder Swan. They look beautiful with the lightly updated graphics, and they sound fantastic even on the mono speaker. However, they are only in Japanese, but if you're a Final Fantasy fan, I'm sure you'll appreciate them. Finally, we get th to the reason why I actually bought the Wonder Swan. This is Mega Man and Base Challenger from the future. Now, I've talked about Mega Man and Base for the Super Nintendo and Game Boy Advance before, and I've often said it is my least favorite Mega Man game of all time. However, it has a sequel, and it only came out into Wonder Swan. And is it better or worse? I mean, I personally enjoyed it more, despite how cramped the Wonder Swan is to play on when you have big meat clobber hands like I do. So overall, the Wonder Swan is very cool and comes highly recommended. Now number four on our list comes from Nintendo's main rival in the early 90s, Sega. Sega! with the Sega Game Gear. Now, this thing on paper should have been able to take down the Game Boy. It had a color screen. But not only does it have a color screen, but it's a backlit color screen. And it looks very nice too for a screen of the time. It had some great Sega hits on it, and it was marketed very well and overall sold 10 million units, which, while respectable, was dwarfed by the Game Boy. So what was the main downfall of the Game Gear? This. This is what the problem was. Six AA batteries for three and a half hours of playtime. Furthermore, the Game Gear is just less portable than the Game Boy. While the form factor is very nice, it's very bulky and feels a bit like you're playing a brick. Furthermore, collecting for the Game Gear is a bit of a pain nowadays because when they made the Game Gear back in the day, they used a bad set of capacitors on it. And many of them has, have died and rotted through the motherboard and oftentimes out in a while you'll find a Game Gear and it looks all great and all, but then you turn it on and you realize either the screen isn't working or the sound isn't working. And while there are people who you can send it off to be recapped, at that point you're going from spending 10 to $20 on a console to 60 to 70. The Game Gear does have some really cool games for it though. Of note are the Sonic games. Now all of these Sonic games were on the Master System as well, well in Europe and Brazil anyways, except for one and that was Sonic Triple Trouble. Sonic Triple Trouble is a really cool game 
where you can play as Sonic or Tails, and you have to go up against Dr. Eggman or Robotnik if you prefer Knuckles, because he's an idiot, and a new guy named Spang the Sniper. And it's honestly a really fun Sonic adventure. Another one of my favorite games on the Game Gear is called Revenge of Drancon, and despite the weird name, it's a port of Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy is like Adventure Island, except it came beforehand and is literally the exact same game. The stage constantly scrolls to the right and you have to jump over obstacles and ride skateboards and shoot axes at things in order to kill them. It's a really fun game and really cheap and easy to find. Finally, this is one that's a bit polarizing, but I'd go ahead and say the first Streets of Rage game for the Game Gear I quite enjoyed. It's not nearly as good as the Genesis games. It's definitely fun and it's dirt cheap too. So overall, the Game Gear also comes recommended, though it's ultimately not higher on the list due to its uh, capacitor issues. Number three on our list is by SNK, and that is the Neo Geo Pocket Color. While the screen isn't backlit or frontlit, it's actually quite easy to see, and the controls are some of the most interesting I've ever seen. It has your ba basic A and B buttons here, but then instead of a D-pad, it has this clicky arcade stick. It feels so good in your hand. The Neo Geo Pocket was very cool and surprisingly affordable compared to SNK's other offerings. They even made a little deal with Sega where they'd make a thing so you could connect this to the Dreamcast and then Sega would make a few games for it. And that's where we get to the games I'd recommend for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. The game that is the reason I bought this is Sonic Pocket Adventure. Sonic Pocket Adventure, I'd say, is a good buy to Classic Sonic. It came out after the first Sonic Adventure game and uses the same character designs from that, but overall the stages and music are all either taken directly from or based heavily off of the Genesis games. It looks beautiful, it plays extremely well, and is overall a real treat to play. Another game I'd highly recommend would be Metal Slug First Mission. Metal Slug is a run and gun game that's a bit more violent than your average Contra. While it's known for its great arcade versions, Metal Slug First Mission on the Neo Geo Pocket is actually a lot of fun. It ha has the same feel and amount of fun as you would in the arcade version, but is better for short bursts. The only thing that's a bit awkward is that in order to throw your bombs, since there's only two buttons, you have to press this rubber select button. Third, and most of all, is something that's a bit too expensive for me to wholeheartedly recommend, but is still very cool nonetheless, and that is the Mega Man game, which is Rockman Battle and Fighters. And what it is, is a port of the two Mega Man arcade games to Neo Geo Pocket. It has all of the stages, music, and whatnot from the arcade games just scaled down to fit on an 8-bit handheld console. The only problem with that game is that it's rather expensive. But if you can find it, it's a lot of fun to play. So overall, the Neo Geo Pocket is highly recommended and a whole lot of fun. Number two on our list is the PlayStation Vita or in my case, the PlayStation TV, because it's easier to find and is much cheaper. We're talking $25 at Walmart compared to $160. But regardless of what you pay and whether you get the home version or the handheld version, the Vita is an incredibly innovative console when it was first released. It had the back touchpad, it was the first console to be able to connect to a 3G network. Grand, you had to pay for AT&T and ugh, no, one, no one wants to do that. And it had actual joysticks on it, and it was really cool. Furthermore, like you can with this, you could connect either a DualShock 3 or a DualShock 4 to it, and you could remote play games from PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4. However, the Vita had a few problems with it. First off, even when it first launched, it was more expensive than the 3DS, which was $250 at launch. It was even more if you wanted a th version that was 3G capable, and that was discontinued only about a year after. Furthermore, instead of adopting something like, say, an SD card, which is what the 3DS used, Sony insisted on using their own proprietary mini memory cards. The Sony memory cards are extremely expensive, and you absolutely need them, because the Vita only comes in with one gig of built-in storage. What the Vita excelled in was as an indie platform and as an RPG platform. And I'm going to go through a, a few of the games, including some RPGs, that I think are worth getting for it. First off is the game that's the reason I bought a PS Vita, East Memories of Celseta. A fun action RPG where you play as Adolf Christian who's lost his memory after map out the massive forest of Celseta and the vain hopes of regaining your memories. It's a lot of fun, and especially when they start introducing other characters to play as, you can easily sink 
hours upon hours upon hours upon hours into this beautiful game. Another game that I have to mention is Persona 4 Golden. Yes, Persona 4 has appeared on other platforms such as the PS2, but this is by far the definitive version. And it's a beautiful looking game that, much like every other Persona game ever made, you can sink nearly a hundred hours into and still have stuff to do. And finally, for something that's not an RPG, I'd recommend Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing Transformed. While this has been on pretty much every single console under the sun, and Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing Transformed is gorgeous on here. And while sure, it's essentially Sega's Mario Kart, it's a wonderfully fun game. So overall, would I recommend still picking up a PS Vita? Absolutely, especially since since stores such as GameStop and EB Games still carry some of the games and accessories. So before we go on to number one, let's recap the list so far. Number five, the majestic bird that is the Wonder Swan. Number four, the Sega Brick Gear. Number three, the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Number two, the PlayStation Vita. And number one, I guess you could say I'm technically cheating for number one because I'm putting an entire category of handhelds in here, but all of them are pretty obscure, and some of them aren't even official. And I'm talking about handheld versions of home consoles. Now the three I'm going to mention here are the PC Engine LT slash the Turbo Express, the Sega Nomad, and the Hyperkin Superboy. Now how do these work? Well, in the case of the Superboy, but this also applies to the Turbo Express and the Sega Nomad, here's a Super Nintendo game. Here's the console and now you can play it on the go. These consoles are all very obscure, and for one reason or another, they never really took off. Now, all of them share some traits. They all tend to be backlit. They all tend to be very comfortable in the hand, though a bit bulky. They also tend to be rather expensive, at launch at least, and have pretty crap battery life. Let's look at the Sega Nomad, for example. It had the same problem as the Game Gear. Six AA batteries for a few hours of gameplay. And furthermore, in the case of the Superboy here, they released a new version recently called the Superboy S, and that one has a widescreen. The problem is these games were made for a 4x3 ratio, which is what you'd find on an old tube TV, and not a 16x9, which is found on most modern screens. The games are either boxed in with black borders on the sides, or stretch to fit, and neither looks particularly good. I'd have to recommend the original Superboy over it, because the new one's quite frankly crap. It gives you the home console experience on the go. All of them also tend to have an output to plug them into a TV, and I'm not sure about the Turbo Express because I've never owned one, though I have played on it, but the Sega Nomad and the Superboy have places to plug in an extra controller or two. So multiplayer is possible. So overall, the, this subset of portable consoles is amazing and is my number one pick on the whole for best obscure portable console, even though it's more than one console. But let's be honest, it's cool. Think of it like the Nintendo Switch, except before the Nintendo Switch. So that's it for today's episode of Stuff We Play. What's your favorite obscure game console? Remember to comment what you think down below, and if you enjoyed this video, to like and subscribe to Stuff We Play, or follow us on Vidme to see more videos every week. So with that, remember to stay classy, and I will see you next time.